Okay, so. I'd, I'd kind of like to summarize. Uh, the good news is that GBIF has done a spectacular job, and no other organization in the world has done so, of uh, assembling, accumulating um, the biodiversity of the planet from observational and voucher records in, 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 in museum and serves it to all sectors of society. The bad news is, is that a good part, a good proportion of, of that data, uh, as Town has just presented, say 10, 20, 30, up to 50 percent, depending on from where and when, um, needs to be corrected. That is not GBIF's fault. In many ways, GBIF would say that is the duty of the data provider. If they serve us garbage, all we can do is also serve garbage. However, I think the solution here is what we've been talking about all week long, partnerships. There has to be a sustained, um, a rigorous partnership between GBIF on the one hand that is serving the data being accumulated, uh, being published from all the data providers and the individual data providers themselves so that when, when data is cleaned, it is perhaps stored in a different cache, sent back to the data providers. They then correct their data and now serve correct data as opposed to the old uh, incorrect data. GBIF can work with the museums, with task forces, with data providers, with institutions on mechanisms and incentives to establish priorities for digitizing all the data that has not been captured and for serving the data that has been captured. There are solutions here as town has, has uh, put forward. So in that sense, the news is good. We can only go forward, but it needs a concerted effort and a concerted commitment. I'd also like to ask, uh, answer your question, Les, about 100-year-old specimens. In the, in the Great Plains of Kansas, we have been suffering about a 50, 60 year incremental drought. In order to solve that problem, in order to answer the question, how can the Great Plains, which is the breadbasket of much of uh, America and the rest of the world, how can the Great Plains be a sustainable ecosystem, both natural ecosystem and a human ecosystem, agrosystem, and so forth. We need those records from a hundred years ago to know what was the biodiversity of the Great Plains a hundred years ago. How much has it changed in the last hundred years based on uh, records from a hundred years ago to today? And what is that telling us about the reaction of the biodiversity and the ecosystem that depends on that biodiversity uh, in the absence of water or a, an incremental shrinking of the water. The other kinds of studies those data will support, of course, are um, how much genomic evolution has occurred in 100 years and driven by what forces. No, we don't have tissues from the 100-year specimens, but sometimes we have the kinds of voucher specimens from which tissues and DNA can be extracted. So. Um, when Town says the 100-year the, the records or 200-year records are baseline, uh, that baseline is critically important if we're ever going to do any studies on the state now. You have to know where you have come from to know where to go forward. And that tells us where we, where we have come from. Fatima, you had a question? Um, I, I was thinking when you were talking about the mechanisms to put in place for improved fitness for use of data. Yes. That perhaps one of the mechanisms also is to look at the principles of when we mobilize the data, which is that we won't touch the data of the data providers. In a case where we could be improving fitness for use, perhaps when we do go and speak to the data providers, that is one of the things we could indicate that it's a potential and a value add for the data providers when GBIF does clean up that data. In that way, there's even that, I mean, that's sort of resolved. Um, that's a good point, yes. Uh, and, and to be fair to GBIF, 
they have examples when they have cleaned the data, sent the clean data back to the data providers, and the data providers have said they don't have the time or the will to correct their own data sets, thank you very much. So there's a lot of work to be done here on both sides. I think in a case like that, if you work on the principle of sharing and that it can be done by GBO, yes. you're actually also eliminating the time layer between GBO then providing the data to the data provider and the data provider uploading it and then that data is accurate. Correct. Because in this case, the accuracy is happening at the level of GBO. It's disseminated more accurately and it's being fed back as well. So the principles would also help if you actually Correct. So the other good news is, sorry, uh, the use of GBIF data in research. I think, uh, as chair of the science committee, and the whole science committee shares this, this uh, uh, thinking, that in the past two years, GBIF has migrated, has evolved from being a startup concern now to being a high growth concern. Why do we say that? Because we have witnessed a virtually an exponential explosion in scientific papers and scientific studies that use GBIF enabled data in their research. This is a testimony to how well the researchers are trusting GBIF data despite all of the uh, a challenges that researchers face in, in cleaning and, and making uh, GBIF data fit for use. The reason there has been this enormous jump in data, of course 2013 is not complete, but we start in 2008 with 52 citations, 89, 148, 170, and 236. And it's predicted that uh, 2013 will uh, be even higher. The reason for this enormous jump, I think, can be reduced down to one factor. We, the, the community of which, uh, and I can and say this very proudly, which University of Kansas Biodiversity Institute and, and town and his colleagues and students at Jorge played an enormous role, was in the development of tools to turn descriptive information, these 400 million records of descriptive information, now into predictive, powerful forecasting information, and that is ecological niche modeling. Now all of that information, suitably clean, suitably made fit for use, can be very, very powerfully turned into what-if scenarios across a broad range of biogeography, human health, uh, pollination, sustainability, conservation, um, and so forth. So it is ironic, it is ironic that just at this time, when GBIF is becoming powerful, serving all this data that can achieve powerful scientific results that then get translated into powerful policy decisions, that GBIF is right on the cusp of uh, uh, continuing with its funding mandate uh, from all of the countries. What are the key scientific themes that some of these, this is going to give you some examples of how GBIF data has been used in translating descriptive into information into predictive uh, information. One of the themes are uh, unsustainable exploitation, climate change, invasive and alien species, loss of natural habitats, agrobiodiversity, protected areas, biodiversity hotspots, threatened species, all of which provide pressures on biodiversity that policymakers and decision makers are attuned to. They then uh, describe the state of biodiversity, the benefits from biodiversity, and will allow decision makers to have responses through biodiversity. And this is essentially what uh, IPES says it will be doing. Here is one example. 
multi-scale analysis of mammal species composition and environmental relationships in the contiguous U.S. They used 300,000 GBIF records on U.S. mammals. They modeled the link between land cover uh, and, and use, climate change, and species composition. And the results are critical for predicting disease transmission and natural resources management. Another example is uh, using remote sensing to map the risk of human monkeypox virus in the Congo Basin. They use GBIF data on rope squirrels, which are vectors of the monkeypox disease, and they modeled the probability of the spread of monkeypox virus outbreaks. A third example is the functional consequences of climate change induced plant species loss in a tall grass prairie. This is in the Great Plains that I've been talking about actually in Kansas. Many of these researchers are at Kansas State University. They use GBIF data to model how climate change will alter the functional productivity of grasslands in Kansas. And grasslands, this is the last natural stand of tall grass prairies uh, in the world and clearly one of the world's breadbaskets. So it's very important for agribusiness forecasting. Another example is the analysis of threats to South American flora and its implications for conservation. They used 500,000 GBIF data records, 16,000 plant records, 24 protected areas containing 70% of the species diversity, and the critical areas identified included uh, areas in Ecuador, the Colombian Andes, Paraguay, Brazil, and the Guyana Shield, and it informed the conservation uh, management of these natural resources in these areas. Uh, another example is climate change impacts on the distribution of date palms in uh, Africa. GBIF data on date palms used to model its habitat suitability. With climate change, many parts of North Africa will lose suitability of date palms and will have an enormous impact on their uh, 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 economic situation. Um, with uh, strategic planning for date palm cultivation being planned according to this kind of niche modeling and of course will affect the economic impacts of climate change on North African agribusiness. Uh, another one concerning human health is the, is the uh, predicted distribution of Anopheles, Albamanus, and Mesoamerica in the Caribbean where GBIF mosquito data combined with climate models and topographic data uh, was used to model how mosquitoes might transmit malaria in the future and a predicted move from lowlands into high altitude region with climate change as high altitude regions become warmer uh, and the increase in malaria risk and the impact on human health. Again, with this information, human health officials can start form formulating interdiction mechanisms more smartly. So, those are just some of the examples how GBIF data have been used, and which is uh, terrifically good news. Summarizing, GBIF is used using ecological niche modeling in all of these areas of uh, important evolutionary studies, conservation studies, sustainability studies, genomic studies, and so forth, all of which can be used by policymakers. How does GBIF envision going forward into the future? It, it, it does so on uh, three areas. 